In this example, we are going to look at bending and shear of a simple idealized fuselage. This idealized fuselage consists of a circular cross section with four stiffeners on the upper half, one, two, three, and four, where one and four have area of 1800 millimeters squared and two and three have an area of 1400 millimeters squared. It's symmetric about the x-axis, so we have the same areas and of the stiffeners on the lower half as well. The radius of this fuselage is two meters and it has a moment mx equal to 800 kilonewton meters and a vertical shear force vy equal to 150 kilonewtons, both acting in the direction shown here. The question also tells us that in the idealization of the four booms in the upper half and the four booms in the lower half, the thickness of the skin can be uh, idealized as being zero thickness. So it is a normal stress carrying boom and a shear stress only carrying panel idealization. The question then asks us for this given idealization to calculate the normal stresses in each boom and the shear flows in each panel. And this is what we are going to do now. So before we jump into the calculation, we could quickly jump in and start calculating moments of inertia, but let's look at uh, the stress equations for normal stress and shear flow because that's really what we're after. So let's look at them and see how they may simplify for our case. So if we look at the stress formulas, we can start with bending stress in each boom. And the bending stress is a given by equation 2.4. It's not different for a boom than it is for a normal structure. So our bending stress is given by, in the most general form, mx times iyy minus my times ixy, all multiplied by y, plus my times ixx minus mx times ixy, all multiplied by x, divided by ixx times iyy minus ixy squared. Very long and complicated formula. However, we can make some simplifications. So first of all, we, also, we know for our problem that our, uh, we only have a moment acting in the x direction. So our moment in the y is in fact zero. So we can look at this term and equate that equal to zero. We can also see that because the x, y axes are axes of symmetry, our product moment of, moment of inertia, i, x, y, is also equal to zero. So those terms as well as this term go to zero. If we see that our i, y, y cancels with what's remaining, and we get that our normal stress is just mx times y over ixx. Okay, so that's our moment, or sorry, our, our normal stress uh, equation for bending. Next, we can look at the change in shear flow across each boom. And for this, we use equation 6.4, which is a specific equation for idealization because treating uh, shear in a boom uh, uh, idealization is slightly different than uh, in a non-idealized section because of how we're dealing with thickness in the skin. So for a boom idealization, our, our Q, delta Q here, is given by negative times uh, everything here in the brackets, which is a ratio of Vy and Vx, and again, we'll have some simplifications, times the area of a stiffener, times the Y coordinate to the stiffener, minus uh, this term in here, times the area of stiffener, times the X coordinate of the stiffener. Now again, our ixy is equal to zero, so the terms with ixy go away, and we do not have vx. We do not have a shear flow, uh, force in the x direction. So, in fact, uh, if we look at the simplification of terms, we get that our total change in shear flow across a single boom is negative vy over ixx times the area of the boom times the y coordinate of the boom. Now, if we look at these two resultant equations, we see that uh, we only have the term ixx. So we don't actually need iyy, ixy happens to be zero. Um, so we only need to calculate that one moment of inertia. So only ixx is needed. And this is given by our equation for our booms, where we sum the y coordinate squared of each boom times the area of each boom. Okay, that's the simplification for a boom uh, approximation or idealization of a structure. Okay, so next we are going to look at, um, oh, sorry, this uh, summation gives us the total ixx, but what we can really look at is that each boom has its own comp uh, contribution to ixx. So if we look at the contribution of boom br, its contribution is just y squared um, 
to that boom number r times the area of boom number r. And the reason we do this is um, it's quite nice and convenient to tabulate the influence of each boom on Ixx on this delta q and on its stress. So we can come up with a table that uh, uh, stores all of this data. That table could look something like this. So it's not filled in in the moment, but we have uh, all of our boom areas, which were given in the problem for each boom number. And we can fill in Ixx for each one. We can calculate sigma z. We can calculate delta q and indeed the y coordinate, which we need in this case, because sigma z uh, and delta q are dependent upon the y position. So we saw in the last slide that sigma z is this mxy over Ixx. We need to be, and, and delta q is negative vy over Ixx times br times y. We need to be a little bit careful here because this is mx in terms of the equation. And for us, uh, because mx is a negative moment, we will end up having a negative number in here. But you'll see that on uh, subsequent slides when we do those calculations. So now let's uh, let's go forward and calculate the terms that we need here, the moment, uh, the, the y coordinates, uh, moment of inertia, and the stresses, and the del delta q's. So if we start with the y locations, that's the easiest thing to look at. So here's an image of our cross section again. We want the vertical distance from our uh, centroid axis here to each boom. And we only need to actually calculate two magnitudes. We can see that both that uh, booms 1, 4, 8, and 5 have the same distance uh, from the y-axis in terms of magnitude. Uh, 1 and 4 will have a negative y because y is positive downwards, where 8 and 5 will have positive. And same with 2, 3, 7, 6 will have the same magnitude, where 2 and 3 are negative and 7 and 6 are positive. So if we look first at y one of 1, 4, 5, and 8, so 1, 4, 5, and 8 all have the same magnitude of the distance. And that distance here is just the radius times the cosine of the angle, which is 30 degrees. So that gives us the projected vertical distance to um, boom 4, uh, but as well as 1, 8, and 5. So that ends up being 1.732 meters. For 2, 3, 6, and 7, we do the same analysis, but now our angle is 10 degrees rather than 30 degrees. So this vertical distance is just radius times cosine of 10, which is almost the radius. In fact, it's 1.969 meters. Okay. We can also look at Ixx for each boom. Now, uh, it's quite convenient in this case that uh, all the booms that have the same y, so 1, 4, 5, and 8, also have the same area. And Ixx is just y squared times the area. So there's only two values we need to calculate here. Uh, we need to calculate Ixx for 1, 4, 5, and 8, which will be uh, y squared. So I've converted the meters here into millimeters. So 1,732 millimeters squared times the area of the boom, which was 1,800 millimeters squared. So that gives us 5.4 times 10 to the 9 millimeters to the power of 4. We do the same for uh, booms 2, 3, 6, and 7. We have our larger y, but our areas are smaller, 1,400 millimeters squared in this case and gives us almost the same resultant moment of inertia. And if we want to know the total moment of inertia of this cross section, we have to add the moments of inertia of all eight stiffeners together. You can do that. It's four times this plus four times this gives us 4.33 times 10 to the 10 millimeters to the power of four. We can take these results and tabulate them. So I now have my Y coordinates here. And now I've taken the magnitudes and applied the right sign. So 1, 2, 3, and 4 are in the negative y uh, side of the axis, where 5, 6, 7, and 8 are in the positive y coordinate. Okay, And uh, we have our moments of inertia. Now we need to calculate our stresses and our delta q's. So we'll do that now. If we first look at our normal stresses, we, again, uh, only need to calculate two magnitudes because uh, Essentially, our equation for moment is m, which is constant, i is constant times y, and we see we only have two versions or two values of y. We have positive and negative, so we have to keep track of compression and, and tension, but the magnitude, there's only two. Okay, so if we look at our moment, it's negative 800 kilonewton meters, which is negative 800 times 10 to the 6 newton millimeters. So the magnitude of the stress at 1, 4, 5, and 8, which all have the same y magnitude of 1732 millimeters we will get a magnitude of the stress equal to 32 megapascals. And because of the sign uh, of our moment, we will get tension in 1, 2, 3, and 4 in compression in 5, 6, 7, and 8. Okay. If we then look at the stress in 2, 3, 6, and 7, 
Our Y coordinate uh, magnitude is 1,970 millimeters. Here's our moment, here's our total I, and we get 36.4 megapascals. And again, the uh, stiffeners above will be uh, in tension and the stiffeners below will be in compression. Now, if we look at a change in shear flow across each boom, our, uh, we again only need to calculate two magnitudes. Uh, and that is uh, that delta Q is uh, V, which is 150 uh, kilonewtons or 150 times 10 to the 3 newtons, divided by IXX, which is 4.33 times 10 to the 10. The formula has a negative sign in front of it, times the area of the boom times the Y coordinate to the boom, which is, gives us 10.8 as a magnitude for 1, 4, 5, and 8. And similarly for 2, 3, 6, and 7, we get a magnitude of delta Q equal to 9.55. Okay. Now let's take these magnitudes and we'll look at what the signs of these will be a little bit more closely in our tabulated solution. So if we look at our tabulated solution, we can put our magnitudes in and we can figure out our signs by looking at our equation. Our moment is negative. So if we have a negative times a negative Y coordinate, we will get a positive bending stress. So you see our bending stresses are positive in our negative Y booms and the, the uh, stresses are compressive in our positive y, because we have a negative moment and a positive quarter, uh, coordinate. You can do the same analysis for delta q. Here we have a negative sign in front of our formula, but our vy was acting down, which is in the positive y direction. So vy is positive, but we have a negative sign here. So delta q will be negative when the sign of the coordinate cancels out this negative sign, because vy is positive. So in the negative y quadrant, again, we will get positive delta Qs, and in the positive y co uh, coordinate frame, we will get negative delta Qs. So what we want to do now is we have our stresses in each boom, but we want to know what our shear flow is in each of these panels between our booms, and all we have is the delta Qs. So I'm going to simplify this because we don't need these Ys and Bs and Ixs Xs anymore. This was used to calculate our stresses. I'm going to simplify this slide and just reduce it to the boom number and the delta Q. Okay. And because it's a closed section, technically speaking, we would have to calculate a basic shear flow, uh, calculate a basic shear flow, and then uh, add a constant shear flow to that that closes the, the, the cutting that we use to make that basic shear flow. However, we do have a nice section that is symmetric uh, with the shear flow through the shear center. And because of that, because of that symmetry, we can see that the shear flow let me just get my pen here. Here, in this center point, has to be zero. Okay? This is the same as if we looked at... Um, if we looked at a square section, thin walled square section, that had a shear force acting downwards like this, we know that our shear flow has to be symmetric and flow around like this. And because of that, it's right at that symmetry axis, the shear flow has to be zero. Okay, so we're doing the exact same thing here. We know our shear flow has to be zero at, uh, at this point and also zero there. So now what we're going to do is create a, da uh, a datum surface. So uh, the easiest thing is to uh, start from the point where we're cutting. So between two and three, our shear flow is zero. Okay, and it's zero, not just at where we cut it, but along this whole portion here, this is equal to zero because we have a constant shear flow between booms in a boom idealization. So what I like to do when we create this datum and we look at the change in shear flow, what we're looking at is the shear flow going around the perimeter in the direction of our datum. Okay, so we're going to be calculating shear flows that are in this direction. Okay, even though we know these shear flows in the right have to be in the opposite direction, this is how we're calculating by summing the changes as we go across each boom. So I know I'm going to get negative numbers for these shear flows on the right because I expect them to be acting downwards rather than upwards. Okay, so let's start by, we start between 2 and 3, and we know that Q2, 3 has to be equal to 0. Okay, now we're going to move in direction S. We're going to cross boom number 2 and look at Q21, and that will be equal to Q2, 
two, three, plus delta q across boom two. Okay, so that's going to be equal to zero plus delta q across boom two, is this value right here, plus 9.55, okay? And so that's equal to 9.55. Uh, the units are, are given here, I'm not gonna write them down, it's newtons per millimeter, uh, but you can see uh, how that works. So now we've hopped from here to here. Now we're gonna hop across stiffener one and look at Q18. Uh, so Q18 is equal to Q21 uh, plus delta Q across stiffener one, which is equal to 9.55 plus 10.8 which gives us a value of 20.4 newtons per millimeter. Okay, we can keep continuing on this within this analysis. So now we're gonna jump across stiffener eight. So Q from eight to seven, because now we're looking between eight and seven, is equal to Q18 plus delta Q across stiffener eight, which will be equal to 20.4. Now, if we look at stiffener eight, it had a negative delta Q, so that's plus negative 10.8 or minus 10.8, and that's equal to 9.55. Okay, and then we continue again. Uh, we're gonna jump across stiffener seven, and we see that Q76. Uh, we already know that it should be zero, but we can double check that this works out. It's equal to Q87 plus delta Q seven, which is equal to 9.55 plus delta Q, which is negative 9.55, so minus 9.55, which is equal to zero. Okay, so it indeed does work out. Now we're gonna jump across stiffener six and look at Q65, uh, which is equal to Q76 plus delta Q6, which is equal to zero plus delta Q6, which is negative 9.55. So zero minus 9.55, which is equal to negative 9.55. So the fact that this is a negative number confirms exactly what we thought. Okay, the negative number just means it's opposite direction than our S datum is indicating. So in fact, uh, instead of being in this direction, we actually have a shear flow of 9.55 in a downwards direction. Okay, and then we can look at jumping over stiffener five, so Q54 is equal to Q65 plus delta Q5, which is negative 9.55 minus 10.8, and that's equal to negative 20.4. And then similarly, you can do Q43, and you get the result that it is equal to negative 9.55, okay? Which we expect because it should be symmetric. Okay, so the fact that these numbers are negative just means it's in the opposite direction than what we see from going uh, with our S datum. Now, the direction you went with your, your datum S actually doesn't matter. If you're consistent, you'll get the same result. So if, instead, uh, if I change my ink color here, if I did S in this direction, I still have between two and three, it's zero. So when I hop over three, I get zero plus uh, delta Q3, which is 9.55, so I would get Q is 9.55 in this direction, which is exactly the same as what we got here. We get negative 9.55 because it's in the opposite direction with this S datum. So uh, a lot of people get confused about what direction. If you are consistent with your datum and you are consistent with the signs for calculating your shear force uh, in the formula, your uh, results will come out correctly. Uh, but it's always good to look at the physics of the problem. Does the shear flow direction make sense with what you would expect in terms of direction uh, when looking at all these problems? So just to summarize that uh, in uh, nice uh, written out text rather than my chicken scratch writing out, there are the resultant shear flows acting all the way around for this problem.